Someone in clinic asked me, hey, Dr. B, what has you excited about the future of MS research and care? There's three things really that's top of mind, and I want to share them with you right now. Don't turn away, because all of that starts right now. Hey! Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. In my clinic the other day, someone asked me what has me excited about the future of MS research and care. And really three things come top of mind. One of them is really philosophical. Another one is a diagnostic prognostic tool. And the third is a new therapy that's on the horizon. I thought I would take a few minutes this morning and share those three exciting things with you. So let's jump in. The first thing that has me excited is a shift in our understanding of MS and a shift in the philosophy of what MS is and how we want to treat it. Let me explain. Until relatively recently, the entire neurology community was really focused, almost laser focused, on acute bouts of inflammation. So we were really talking a lot about relapses and attacks. We were really talking a lot about new spots on the MRI. Now, those are very important, and when I pick a therapy for a patient, I absolutely want to decrease or stop attacks. I absolutely want to stop new spots on the MRI. No question about that. But that is not the entirety of multiple sclerosis. In fact, I would submit to you it's actually a smaller part than we ever realized. Many of you who have participated on this channel have heard me talk about this evolution with a new focus on smoldering multiple sclerosis. You've heard me talk about different ways that people impacted by MS can become worse, not just relapse-associated worsening, or RAW, but also progression which is independent from relapse activity, or PIRA, P-I-R-A. The reality is that if we only focus on stopping new attacks, and we only focus on stopping new spots on the MRI, we're kind of missing the boat. I can't tell you how often a family comes to my office and they're really frustrated and confused because the, the drug they're on is apparently working. They're not having new relapses. They're not having new spots on the MRI. The doctor that referred them to me says, hey, everything's awesome. And yet the patient isn't doing very well. They're progressing in their disability. They're losing function. They're losing their ability to do things that they could do just a year ago. So what's up with that? This is really getting at maybe the soft underbelly of multiple sclerosis and the reality that relapses in new spots are not the end all be all in that MS is a slow steady decline in function that we really need to be honest about and address. When we look at therapies and new therapeutic interventions, we need to look beyond just stopping new spots. We need to pay attention to slow smoldering disease and the slow loss of function. And I'm not talking about primary progressive MS. I'm not talking about secondary progressive MS. I'm talking about all forms of MS, including early relapsing disease. The reality is when you look carefully in clinical trials, you can see even in early diagnosed patients with relapsing disease that in between attacks, there can be some slow progression of disability. Now, this is not a gloom and doom concept because some of our more effective therapies actually can impact PIRA, progression independent from relapse activity. But the reason that I'm excited is because the neurological community is starting to recognize the importance of PIRA. They're starting to recognize the importance of what my friend Gavin Giovannoni calls the real multiple sclerosis or smoldering MS. And I think that paradigm shift is really, really important. If we can be honest with ourselves, if we can be honest with our patients, if we can honestly consider the full spectrum of multiple sclerosis, it's going to open our eyes and it's going to open research doors to developing new avenues of therapy that can really smush smoldering disease. So the first thing that I'm really excited about is this paradigm shift. Where we're becoming more aware and more honest about all of the pathology that's going on in MS. Hey, before we go on, do me a favor. If you get some value out of this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Those two actions teach the YouTube algorithm that you dig this content, and then it helps push it out so more families impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. 
The second thing that has me really excited is the development of a new biomarker in multiple sclerosis. So what the hey hey is a biomarker? A biomarker is a test or a study which gives you insight into a human's health or into the status of a disease. The MRI machine, for example, is a very powerful biomarker. Because of the use of the MRI machine, for example, we can diagnose MS three times faster than before, which is a really big deal because the faster you diagnose MS, the faster someone gets on therapy and the better they do long term. Also, when someone is on an MS therapy, we can use the MRI as a biomarker. One of the ways that we can assess is the drug working. So if someone's on a, a disease modifying therapy and the MRI shows new brain damage, new lesions, well, that's a biomarker that things aren't going well. The MRI, however, is not the end all be all. It's not the all knowing, all singing, all dancing information. It's very, very expensive and it only gives us a picture of structure. I think about Star Trek, so I'm gonna date myself and I'm a, a nerd and a Trekkie. And I think about that famous intergalactic doctor, uh, Bones McCoy, right? So he had a tricorder and he would scan an alien Damn it, Jim, they've got multiple sclerosis, right? He would use this tricorder and it would help diagnose nearly anything. And boy, I really want a tricorder. That was a biomarker that he had. Well, there's a new biomarker that's being developed in multiple sclerosis. It's called neurofilament light. So let me break that down for you a little bit. When there is damage to the nervous system, the axons, which are the nerves, um, I'll use this as a prop. So pretend this is an act, a, a, a neuron, all right? And it's got this long projection called an axon. Well, when there's damage to it, right? And it gets damaged, then the axon breaks and all the proteins inside the axon get dumped out into the spinal fluid. And they eventually make their way from the spinal fluid into the blood. And some of those proteins can teach us very, very important things. In the axon, there are neurofilaments, so like these, these chains. There's neurofilament heavy chain, neurofilament medium chain, and there's neurofilament light chain. Well, it turns out that the higher level of neurofilament light chain that we see floating around in the spinal fluid and the higher level of neurofilament light chain that we see floating around in the blood correlates with damage from multiple sclerosis. Now, this is not yet prime time. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done before we can reliably and easily order this in clinic. But the idea is really, really exciting. Here's why. The research to date has shown us that when someone has active disease, neurofilament light goes up. When that disease is treated, neurofilament light goes down. If you have someone with MS and you put them on a mild to moderate therapy, neurofilament light drops some. If you put them on a highly effective therapy, it drops even more. When people have progression of disease in some of these studies, neurofilament goes up. Before an MS attack, neurofilament goes up. So you can imagine a blood test that would give us insights into the status of someone's multiple sclerosis. You could imagine a blood test that would tell us, hey, you're not really responding to that therapy. And a blood test for neurofilament light is obviously easier to obtain and will probably be cheaper than an MRI. I imagine a future state where we're checking this laboratory, blood neurofilament light chain, several times a year, and it would massively assist us in managing people with MS. Now I'll say it again, it's not prime time yet. There's still a lot of details to be worked out. For example, what is the baseline level of neurofilament light chain in people? As we age, that goes up. When there are other neurological conditions like head trauma, stroke, ALS, these kind of things, it goes up. So it's not something that I feel comfortable just ordering today in 2023 and using. But in my estimation of the research, I do think that when under five years from now, it's gonna be available for us in clinic. And I'm really excited. It'll kind of be like Bones McCoy, <whistles> having a tricorder. That's number two. The third thing that has me really excited is the development of a new therapy. And this is brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors or BTK inhibitors. I've talked about them a couple times on this channel, but I wanted to share it uh, with you today again because I'm still really, really excited about it. When a therapy comes to market for MS and it's a me too drug, I don't get terribly excited. 
What I mean by that is, if we have a B cell depleter that's available to treat MS, and we make a second B cell depleter, that's fantastic, but it's not a breakthrough in therapy. It's not bringing new things to light. Well, routine tyrosine kinase inhibition, or BTK inhibitors, very likely will bring new options or new transformative ways of treating MS to the table, and that has me excited. Mechanistically, there are two things that BTK inhibitors can do, which our current therapies can't do. The first is that BTK inhibitors seem to be able to block B cell signaling without killing B cells. So I made mention a second ago of B cell depleters. These are very, very effective therapies. Things like rituximab, ocrelizumab, ufutumumab, ublituximab. Those are four therapies that are currently being used to treat MS and the way they work is they murder B cells. Now, when you deplete adult B cells, it prevents them from stimulating T cells to beat up your brain and spinal cord, which is great. But there's an increased risk of infection when you kill B cells. So BTK inhibitors don't kill B cells. They just stop B cell signaling. So in my mind, it's kind of like plugging their ears, like la la la, I can't hear you. And that will interrupt the pathology of MS but without the same risk of infection, which is pretty darn cool. The second thing that BTK inhibitors can do is really exciting. I've talked about this on the channel before, but the immune system is really, really big. And if you think about it, there's kind of two halves to the immune system, if you will. There's the adaptive immune system, and this is the B and T cells. And all of our current therapies really focus on B and T cells. But there's another part of the immune system called the innate immune system. And we know that the innate immune system is involved in MS. We also struggle to be able to impact the innate immune system. Moreover, there's MS pathology in the bloodstream and inside the central compartment. In a lot of our therapies, not only can they not impact the innate immune response, but they also can't get into the brain. Now, this is a real problem. And BTK inhibitors can impact both. These small molecules can cross the blood-brain barrier, they can get inside the noggin, and they can deactivate parts of the innate immune system, specifically microglia. And so, for both of these reasons, I'm terribly excited for the development of BTK inhibitors. At the Boster Center for MS, we're doing a lot of clinical trials right now. No less than five of them are studying BTK inhibitors for relapsing forms of MS, for primary progressive forms of MS, and for secondary progressive forms of MS. Now stay tuned because the trials are ongoing, but I'm very excited about the preliminary data. I make this video in July 2023, and I'm overwhelmed that we are this close to hitting 50,000 subscribers. So I wanna thank each and every one of you. If you would like to help this channel grow, the biggest thing that you could do is to watch another video. So please click the video that's on your screen right now. And until my next Monday morning vid or my next monthly live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.